In this edition of Big Picture, we will analyze where India stands with regards to what's happening um, with regards to Russia and Ukraine and the West and what the flurry of activity as far as foreign policy is concerned over the last past week means for India and the region. And joining me on the program uh, to talk about the current Russia-Ukraine situation and where India and the West stand, I have with me on the program today, uh, Ashok Sajjanhar, former ambassador, and Professor Swaran Singh, School of International Studies, JNU. Thank you to both my guests for joining me on this edition of uh, Big Picture. The language that was used was, I would say, aggressive, be it the uh, deputy NSA of the United States, you know, saying that would it would Russia, would, you cannot count on Russia uh, if there is something that happens at the LAC. For instance, uh, India too, uh, you know, sent out a very strong message to the UK when the UK brought up the issue of Russia and oil uh, imports from Russia into India as well. What do you make of the kind of language that was used and the kind of, you know, posturing that we saw? Uh, thank you, Frank. Uh, in fact, lately, we've been hearing about the wolf warrior diplomacy of Chinese. Uh, here is an example of uh, a similar wolf warrior diplomacy from the United States, uh, where you uh, notice, as you said, a rather uh, aggressive or assertive language being used to browbeat as if uh, India, which of course is not functioning. And uh, to me, that increasingly reflects uh, uh, desperation of United States, where it has almost failed to get its closest allies uh, to fall in line with uh, what uh, United States would like uh, them to do, uh, despite all the hype of NATO unity, and despite all the hype about you know, severe, unbearable sanctions, et cetera, et cetera, uh, we continue to notice uh, you know, West being largely a divided house, other than China, which is, of course, the largest recipient of uh, Russian energy oil. Uh, you look at the next largest five nations, they are all very close friends and allies of United States. And, uh, you know, the recent uh, reports are saying that uh, some of these allies in, in Europe have actually increased uh, purchase of energy from uh, Russia uh, in, in the month of March. So in that sense, uh, this perhaps reflects to me rather a sense of desperation where all that uh, European uh, allies could say is that, oh, we will try to bring it to zero by end of the year. Of course, hoping that uh, the conflict would be over before end of the year and they can continue to buy Russian oil and gas. Uh, Germany enormously depends on Russian gas. So to me, this uh, the kind of effort of beating India into falling in line because they thought they were some interesting examples they had seen earlier, whether in case of Venezuela you know, supplying oil to India or Iran supplying oil to India, and India, of course, more or less aligning uh, in those issues uh, in, in stopping to purchase those uh, countries' uh, oil uh, you know, as far as Indian imports were concerned. But Russia is a very, a very different example. India's uh, relationship with Russia is uh, completely different. And not that United States and UK and others don't understand it, uh, but they just want to push India into, you know, falling in line the way they thought India fell in line in case of uh, uh, Iran, for example. And India has stood firm on its ground. Of course, uh, India also has uh, lately moved from non-alignment to multi-alignments, which means India, which means India has very good relationships with uh, almost all major powers today, which is a unique example uh, that has never happened in history. And that you know, almost all major powers are today trying to so, so to say cultivate India's uh, aligning with their position, and India has to very carefully you know, look at what it uh, wants to do in case of sort of uh, its its policy vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine crisis. And so far, to me, it appears that Ukraine crisis are almost beginning to look like an opportunity for India in showcasing its uh, assertive and, and and neutrality, which is to me very proactive. Very, in fact, no other nation, uh, when they started issuing advisories to their citizens to leave Ukraine, were offering to pick them up. The way India did, uh, 22,500 uh, Indians and uh, 147 uh, other citizens to be brought out safely out of a uh, war zone, that was a first reflection of multi alignment India's being really in close talking terms with both Moscow and uh, Ukraine in Kiev. 
otherwise minus that coordination that big enterprise experiment would not have been possible and then after that experiment india started sending you know 90 metric tons of humanitarian aid to ukraine india started talking of buying russian oil and other commodities on discounted price so it's a policy which is establishing the exceptionalism of indian foreign policy now mm. which of course all these major powers increasingly understand uh, but they're just kind of uh, uh, sort of posturing as if they can push india to fall in line uh, i believe that uh, the, the kind of push from united states has been much more open and vocal mm. and of course you know, uk normally you know finds its global existence or global presence only in singing the american tune and so it just sings the same lyrics that america wants to present moscow's nudging of india has been relatively uh, nuanced and closed door i suppose so lavrov's visit to india clearly was meant to sort of nudge india in in coming you know sort of more in 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 line with what is moscow's line on it but right. india has also clearly taken position which is now showing a certain evolution over a period of time which is now clearly saying that we should focus on international law united nations charter which is a step ahead of its earlier statement of you know, sovereignty and territorial integrity or go before that you know the language of uh, concern Uh, and then of course regret and then of course deploring so if you notice last five weeks there is an enormous evolution in india's uh, semantics in, sure. in the diplomaties that we have seen and i assume heart of heart all these major powers are beginning to recognize and perhaps accept that exceptionalism of india's foreign policy today absolutely so going uh, taking this particular aspect forward professor you know what does all of this mean for um, you know india russia relations as well because we've seen lavrov coming to india you know india has categorically stated as well you know the finance minister has uh, said that why shouldn't india buy cheap oil from russia when it is available to us because it is a matter of national interest for us so you know taking this kind of a stand supporting well not directly but you know indirectly supporting russia as well because we are looking at our own national interests does it send out a message to moscow as well and where does this take india russia ties uh, very clearly uh, frank west uh, largely looks at india's uh, so called uh, proactive neutrality as pro moscow uh, they think that india's neutrality has been tilting uh, at least tilting towards moscow and they would like to see that india's neutrality instead should be tilting if not bandwagoning Uh, united states and its friends and allies uh, but the message is clear that india has underlined its uh, uh, enduring and very close time tested uh, and a whole range of defense cooperation based uh, relationship with russia which will uh, stay on as it is and i think to some extent will this kind of uh, example would further reinforce uh, their uh, uh, not just uh, uh, procurements in defense equipment but uh, constant joint production joint development and joint research and development of various equipment con- in coming times uh, indeed this could open possibilities of india's uh, greater engagement uh, with russia's energy sector uh, this whole talk about uh, 6 million uh, gallons of uh, shipping of oil uh, in, in you know recent weeks uh, is minuscule i mean uh, on average i think china uh, procures 4 million gallons every day Uh, so in in volume this may not be in almost certain uh, procurement even after this uh, upping the ante or or uh, accessing a uh, deeply discounted uh, uh, oil uh, you know, from russia but this obviously is going to open a kind of a thinking in india should be not broad based uh, our procurements uh, uh, from russia and also other other suppliers of uh, oil and how far should be continuously Uh, be dependent on the united states i mean both examples of its uh, unusually crazy exit from uh, afghanistan and now standing kind of uh, aloof with just a uh, hype of nothing more than standing ovations on online speeches of uh, zelensky uh, us has virtually you know as zelensky says repeatedly left him alone But that obviously will give lessons to several other nations how far Uh, one can depend on united states and should it really be careful in not uh, a sort of aligning far too much with the united states you have to just look at uh, has united states criticized china's uh, military action on uh, and the line of actual control 
I mean, this blunt saying that, you know, Russia is not the country that will help you in case of Chinese aggression. <clears throat> What has China, what has United States done uh, in, in case of uh, China's uh, military uh, advancements on on a line of actual control? So I think United States understands its uh, kind of uh, rapidly declining uh, uh, goodwill around its uh, at least newfound friends, and that would obviously bring us to focus on countries like South Africa, which has become increasingly vocal now. Brazil and imagine Brazil, China, Russia, and the BRICS nations are now going to meet at end of the year, and that could again this could be another glue as to how Ukraine crisis can be a lesson for them to learn as to how how do they broad base their relationship, balance their relationship, how do they engage with United States, which is repeatedly proving uh, to either stay kind of uh, you know at distance or. Pursue its national interest such that it can really ditch a close ally where it was present for 20 years. That has enormous lessons for everybody else. Of course, I often say, as a teacher, wherever United States military has gone after Second World War, it has come out after making bigger mess than what existed before it went into any of the a dozen situations uh, since end of Second World War. Should oh. that be a lesson to to country like India? And I think that should reinforce India's understanding of how it will stay on in close connection with Russia and a whole range of other countries, including China, I dare say, where that relationship is obviously broad-based and not really tilting towards any singular nation, definitely not the United States. Absolutely. Professor, please close the show for us with your quick concluding remarks. Uh, thank you. I am in full <laughs> agreement. I, I have said that India has moved from non-alignment to now multi-alignments. So India definitely wants to sustain good uh, and then mutually beneficial relationship with the all major powers. That's what India has been doing, uh, except that uh, United States would uh, like to look at a relationship as uh, either or. They would like to uh, sort of wean India away from Russia. And uh, they have been uh, doing all the time. In fact, uh, the most uh, vocal voices were uh, coming during uh, President Donald Trump's uh, time, that they wanted uh, to replace uh, uh, Russia as a source of uh, military supplies to India. Uh, somehow, uh, till date, United States is only the fourth largest supplier to Indian defense equipment uh, after uh, Russia, Israel, France, and then United States. Uh, technology transfers, uh, you know, whether it is civilian nuclear power reactors or it is any other defense technology, uh, are largely a pipe dream when it comes to United States. The, most fruitful and equal uh, defense partnerships have been, of course, with uh, Russia so far. And in that sense, uh, I think this kind of equilibrium that India is exploring uh, would have its own challenges coming from United States uh, wanting to sort of make India uh, push into choosing sides, which India absolutely is not comfortable <laughs> into choosing sides. And I think United States over a period of time is showcasing a, a very clear inclination to sell weapons. And not to send its soldiers on the ground to or to or to even uh, make any political statements in support of any country, whether it is Taiwan or it is uh, Eastern Europe uh, members of the NATO uh, or India. You know they are happy to sell weapons without technology transfers, and uh, that serves them well to make money without uh, giving technologies at all to any country. So these things are something that India clearly is learning, and that's why this exceptionalism of Indian foreign policy where we are trying to multi-align and balance and create equilibrium in multi-alignment of various countries is something that is sometimes seen as not going very well with United States. And you mm. see sometimes comments coming like from Deputy NSA, the Lip Singh comments coming in Delhi, which received, I think, very apt rebuttal at appropriate level. And I assume over time, they'll have to get used to India being a large market, potentially a large economic partner and defense partner. And uh, India will have its own, uh, you know, sort of uh, benchmarks as to how it will be happy to engage uh, with United States. And Ukraine crisis provides an excellent example of India's balancing uh, effort in making sure it constantly stayed, stays in close contact with all major powers and doesn't get pushed into choosing sides that United States would like India to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, gentlemen, we'll have to leave to that. Thank you so much for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. Thank you and see you again next time.